Hello, it's Scott Manley here. When I was young, rockets were spectacular, but short-lived. Their life would be measured in minutes. They would carry payloads to the edge of orbit and then burn up and fall into the ocean. But last night, I think we may have had the first booster to die from being too old. Yes, Falcon 9 Booster 1062, a veteran of 23 launches starting back in November of 2020. It started out launching GPS, it launched Inspiration 4, Axiom 1, and of course a metric crap ton of Starlink satellites. And last night, uh, it was going for its 23rd launch. Now, it hadn't been expected to launch because this week it was going to be all about the Polaris Dawn Party. Now, Monday, they were getting ready to launch on Tuesday morning, and then they had to cancel that because of issues with helium. Then on Tuesday, they decided to hold off because weather, and the next opportunity had been Thursday, but SpaceX realized they had enough of a window that they could squeeze in a Starlink launch. And so, yeah, 1062 took to the skies and successfully placed the second stage into its, uh, you know, suborbital trajectory. The mission was a success, but then on the way back to Earth, the plucky booster, the legend, the life leader, it had something go wrong during the landing. What we see immediately after landing is a whole lot more fire and a booster slowly toppling over as one of the legs collapses. There's a puff of liquid oxygen, but yeah, that is the end of Booster 1062. And in a couple of days, we are very likely to see it come back to port in, well, whatever condition it's left in. Now, as I said, the Starlink launch itself was successful, but because we've had a failure of hardware, then uh, they're going to perform an investigation. FAA, of course, wants investigations. SpaceX also probably wants an investigation just to make sure it doesn't affect its booster. But what can we tell from the footage that we have? So first up, this is a Starlink launch. That means they try to maximize the payload. That means it is landing on a barge, which is a shortfall of gravitas. The launch was to the northeast. It was actually relatively similar inclination to what we were expecting from Polaris Dawn. The live stream footage I have is from Twitter. It's only 720p. And there's also this really annoying cut right at the moment of landing, which kind of confuses what we're looking at. So. I can go back and fix this by reframing things. So yeah, this just involves some basic cropping and uh, rescaling, and I've got the telemetry data uh, down in the bottom left. I think the telemetry data lags by about one second. This is also running at one quarter frame rate, so you can get a better handle on what's going on. Now, as usual, the camera on the barge, the first thing it sees is the rocket blast coming down and bouncing off the barge. Now, the problem, of course, is this is a night view the rocket is very, very bright, and so the automatic gain on the camera is adjusting and makes it very hard to see what's going on. And then once the main engine shuts down, there's a bit of fire, which again continues to saturate the sensors, but the camera eventually scales things back and we start to see the rest of the barge come into view as the vehicle's starting to tip over. And so between the low quality and the massive changes in brightness, it's actually very hard to see anything that's going on here. However, if we assume that we can trust the telemetry in the bottom left, the speed at no point reaches zero, which implies that the vehicle landed with a bit more velocity than we normally see. If you look at other versions of the flight, we can compare these side by side. Now, the one on the left is also a landing from shortfall of gravitas. It's also a Starlink Group 8. These should be very similar. Notice the velocity in the bottom left. These are synchronized to being the point where the engine shuts down after touchdown. Although, to be clear, that was kind of hard to measure on last night's one because there was a little more fire than expected. But using the same barge means the camera is in the same location. And although the booster hasn't landed in the same location, we, we can absolutely see the difference in, in what's going on here. This one on the left is standing a whole lot higher. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it, it hit too fast. It's not clear why they hit too fast. Now, what happened? Well, if you now look at this in slow motion, you can see a number of things starting to fail. First of all, 
It's pretty easy to see the strut that is supporting the landing leg that is on the right and furthest away from us. That's basically falling away against the rocket. Now these are like big pneumatically deployed cylinders. They're pressurized with helium and that's what helps push them out initially and then gravity helps lock them in place. In this case, it looks like after it hit, that ended up breaking and the two parts can be seen falling back down under gravity. So without that strut holding the leg, that's what ends up collapsing and the whole vehicle falls over. Now, I would normally expect these cylinders to buckle under the load, but this one actually seems to have like shattered or I, I'm not exactly sure the failure mode. It could be that the hinge ended up breaking near to the rocket uh, because these two, it seems to be in two parts that are separated. And if we rewind the video, and play the exact moment of the engine shutdown and then we just ping pong the video back and forth. You can actually see that the entire booster stack is moving up and down and those engine bells are coming very close to the deck, probably contacting the deck. And those engine bells touching the deck are probably enough to explain why instead of a clean shutdown with a bit of fire, we get a massive conflagration the moment of that impact, which very quickly spreads out and you know causes uh, that large fireball that we see. And you can also ping pong the moment of landing back and forth and you can see the struts, especially the one nearest on the right, actually flexing and flopping back and forth, you know, vibrating because of the force that's been put on this. Okay, so given the amount of fire after the landing, it's probably not a fuel exhaustion issue. But how about the approach? How does that compare? Well, the early um, Group 8 launches, they only launched 20 satellites. Now they're launching 21. Um, and it looks like as they've switched to the 21 satellites, they're now coming in and performing their entry burn at a little higher speed. But it's not like this one was faster. In fact, the previous one before that, which was during the daytime, it actually hit the atmosphere going slightly faster and still landed safely. So it's not like it's underperforming early on in the approach and descent and you know, entry burn. And then if you compare the final landing burn against the previous Group 8, you know, the performance over the last few seconds is broadly comparable. It's not like there's obviously an engine uh, deficiency on one side. I don't think there's an engine problem. All we see is that one hits the deck when it's still moving about, you know, 10 kilometers per hour. And just looking at the deceleration curves, it, you know, that 10 kilometers per hour is something that would get rid of in a fraction of a second. So that actually in distance terms translates to a couple of meters and it's well within the capability of the, of the booster to correct for that because it has to land on a barge and the barge is known to move up and down slowly with the waves. Now, while Polaris Dawn launch was cancelled because of your sea state in the recovery areas, it was just bad for crew recovery. It was totally like chill for booster landing. So I, even with a massive rogue wave, I don't think that's a factor. If we rewind to Starlink 3, there's an interesting landing where the booster stops just above the deck and falls down and you see the legs splay out as the crush cores absorb the force. Now, I don't know if that was due to a radar error or like the barge moving up and down, but either way, we can use the laws of physics to figure out how far it fell and how fast it hit and know that this is more than what the telemetry number said for this flight. Therefore, I think that we should concern ourselves less with the extra velocity at landing. I think that is an artifact of the problem that caused the booster to fall over. We can see that with four good landing legs, the booster is more than capable of handling this. And if you look at other landings, you will see maybe a bounce, a bit of a shift sideways. I think that it just didn't have four good legs anymore. Its legs were getting old. And through repetitive landings and impacts and stress, the composite material had just eventually reached its limit. And something either in the strut or in the leg itself or in the hinge let go and with only three legs, well at that point the force was more than those three legs could handle. That caused the whole thing to splay out and the uh, engine section to smash into the deck. Now I don't know if they replaced the legs between flights uh, at any cadence. Like I'm 
it's understandable that they would age. Like in the early days of the boosters, they actually had to manually fold up the legs and that had it a whole extra day. And we know that they can take the legs off of boosters when they are expending them. So it's reasonable that they might replace them. So I don't know for sure how old the legs on this specific booster were. So look, to summarize, I don't think this is an engine problem. I don't think the waves were huge. I think there may have been a small navigation error that is consistent with previous landings. I think that the legs were likely old and this is a recovery only issue that shouldn't actually affect flights going forwards. But we are going to have enough of an investigation to convince the FAA that the problem is understood. That SpaceX wants to convince themselves that the problem is understood. They are, after all, putting one of their biggest fans on a rocket for his spacewalk. So I totally expect that they will do, you know, dot their I's, cross their T's. And I, I'm sure they will get flying within a couple of weeks. They might even get flying in a few days. I doubt it, but it, it's entirely possible. They can ask the FAA to, to basically say, hey, you know, we think we understand this, even if you have not closed the investigation. Notably, while SpaceX have you know identified the problem for the you know that caused the July failure, the FAA has yet to close that investigation, as I understand it. But if SpaceX takes a couple of weeks to close out this to the FAA's satisfaction, then this will potentially have knock-on effects. Polaris Dawn could you know, is set to launch in a few days you know, after weather changes. That may have to be pushed back further because in September, there's a very important launch of Europa Clipper that has to go on a Falcon Heavy. We have Crew 9 that has to go, and they don't want to delay that because you know there are crew on the space station waiting for that. Uh, if that does have to get delayed, that in turn will probably uh, feed into a delay on the departure of Starliner. So yeah, I think Polaris Dawn is the mission that is standing to get the biggest delay. And by the way, I did point out that this was the booster that failed was the booster that launched Inspiration 4. So losing that booster days before uh, you know another flight by the same person doesn't doesn't exactly smack of good omens. But as I said, as I've previously said. You know, it's bad luck to be superstitious. I noted that Cyan Proctor posted about uh, this booster failure because, of course, the crew of Inspiration 4, they signed the side of the booster and people have been able to see, pick out those signatures in the suit uh, for launches following that. And it is interesting that, of course, we've got this booster, we've lived for so long with it, it's our favourite booster and now it has failed, it's gone to join the big booster scrapyard in the sky. I, I would love if they would start cutting up the sheet metal and like selling bits off it to collectors. It really is a modern luxury that we can get attached to this particular booster that has done so much for us. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.